truly want to go digital, it's quite simple. The first one is telecommunication. There has to be enough internet everywhere at least 30 megabits per second. If people cannot access stuff in their mobiles or at home with a normal speed, there is no trust towards the government and services. The second thing is that everybody has to have a digital name and it has to be recognized by private sector also, not only government sector. There has to be strong digital identity connected with that unique identifier so people actually could use the services behind mobile device or behind the computer. The third principle is that you have to put standards in place to make data exchange happen. Like there has to be motivation to exchange data between different institutions, also between government bodies and any private sector institution. Fourth is trust. People have to feel that their data is protected, their privacy is protected. People have to trust this whole digital ecosystem. The fifth principle is proper understanding of privacy and data protection. Being connected doesn't mean that you give away your privacy. The sixth principle is no legacy. And there has to be a rule that all like, major meaningful applications shouldn't be older than 13 years. And the seventh principle is you have to continuously amuse people. When people see some cool stuff, they start demanding it more. You have to provide them with totally new solutions, the new way of thinking. That drive has to be in DNA of your employees. Hello, my name is Tavi Gotka. I'm a former Chief Information Officer of Estonian Government and today representing Proud Engineers and uh, Reliant Geo. Uh, as you saw, I mean, building digital society needs at least seven uh, crucial steps. And uh, like, obviously, the, having enough internet is, is the baseline. But the second best thing, or the second issue that needs to be solved is how we see our people, how we see our customers, how we see our citizens, patients, etc. And it's funny that still, like globally, this problem is not solved. I mean, in most societies, in most countries, uh, government and the private sector sees a person in a different way, even though the attributes are the same, like the name, surname, uh, addresses, etc. So there are no unique identifiers that identify uh, those people for both sectors. Yes, there are social security IDs, there are patient IDs, there are different kind of IDs, but, but those IDs are mostly sector-based or discipline-based. For example, the social security ID can be used only in healthcare and for taxes, but not for banking, etc. Which means that it's basically like impossible to build like services in a way where like you get, take information from the private sector, let's say uh, tax declarations, and you carry that information to your like government declaration, and you pull information from different sources because John Smith in one system is not the same John Smith in other system. And governments have tried to solve this in many different ways. Like for example, in Japan they call it my number project. Uh, like one ID, like one unique identifier for all the citizens, but with a crucial mistake. With a mistake that it's secret number, it's not a public number. But if it's a, not the public number, then again, private sector cannot use it. Again, we cannot combine information from private sector with the government data. But how are we going to do AI? How are we going to do machine learning? How are we going to predict future if we can't use all the data sources? Um, there are Way better examples, let's say, uh, from China, uh, also from North Europe, uh, Scandinavia, Baltics, uh, who actually have those capabilities. And there is one more like, beautiful example, which is India, uh, the Aadhaar project. So India started uh, more than 10 years ago to give uh, unique identifiers to their people like in return of the biometrics. And it was a successful pro project. The way that now you can identify a person allowed the government to spread uh, money in a way that uh, like a lot of corruption was removed and like 
lot of people got out from the poetry. So um, unique identifi identifiers are important. And also it's important to understand like uh, when you start building this digital society, who is actually behind device? But how to do that? Like what is the identifier? How you authenticate yourself? So today, large enterprises try to solve this by themselves. Like we use Google IDs, we use Apple IDs, uh, we use Facebook IDs. But um, I mean, the fact that the OTP worked and, and I got an email and I, I clicked that email, yeah, it's fun, but like, how can I be sure that behind the device is exactly that John Smith? So it's a struggle. And it's a question like how society should approach this. I mean, uh, we could say that, oh, it's everybody's problem. Like, uh, but if you start calculating, if it's everybody's problem, then FinTech needs to solve it, like Telco needs to solve it, like marketplaces need to solve it, uh, government needs to solve it, healthcare need, needs to solve it, education needs to solve it. I mean, why it has to be so expensive? Like, can we actually create something that everybody will accept and use? And that's a key question. Like, uh, we have seen, for example, a remarkable example from Sweden, uh, where the banks actually took the initiative created something that everybody could use as a digital identity, and uh, the government was basically sleeping until they discovered that, hmm, it's so widely spread, everybody's using it, so why not to use it? Or let's take the example of Estonia, where private sector made an order uh, that like, uh, we should have like national digital identity, and then the government took the lead, Estonian police started to issue those, those identities, and voila, like we are here where we are at the moment, thanks to that. But there are not too many very positive examples of this kind of collaboration. Uh, but without having like private sector working together with the government, no digital society will happen. Why? I mean, like one thing is that like there has to be clear understanding like who issues those documents and like how you can say that law. Like, this is a unique ID and this is a digital identity that belongs to that person. Like setting up all this is complicated. Um, Australia has tried twice, uh, both time failed. Uh, why? Because those kind of reforms take time and like parliament cycles are just four years and four years are not enough to make this change happen. So um, here, like even with Estonia, if you look at the screen, you can see like things didn't went as planned, like the blue line uh, represents uh, the actual usage of the digital identity, and the black line uh, represents like uh, how it was pushed to people. In Estonia, having a digital identity was mandatory. That's why the, like I say, the takeaway was good, but not with the services. Because in the beginning, you have that kind of chicken and egg problem. Like people don't want to use uh, like a new tool or new functionality if there are not enough services. And the service providers, they cannot see like, why they should support new technology if there are not enough users. So making this decision in society that, oh, why don't we, in our country, agree between the private sector and the government that we will solve the question, who is behind the device? And we will solve it together like, like, as two sectors, where basically the government sector can start like represent the issuing part and the private sector promises that they will actually deliver enough services that to motivate people to use it. Only then this might happen. And in, even then, if you have this agreement, um, you might expect what we call CIO nightmare, where there are not enough users or not, not enough services, and politicians and society will look at you and say, like, where is the money, Lebowski? So, Proud Engineer is a company like, who helps uh, like governments, CIOs, uh, societies to understand those changes and like, how to basically deal with them. What kind of legislation you need, what kind of people you need, what kind of organizations you need to build, uh, what processes need to be put in place, what technologies could be used, like how to set up the tenders, etc. So uh, like, uh, if you need more information in those areas, we are definitely there to help. And obviously, like, this is all, like, if you put it in place, it's a cornerstone for your digital society to start actively exchange data between different data sources. And to make it even more 
challenging. Uh, as you know, like Estonians can vote over the internet. We have done it since 2005. And we just like recently spoke with India that this could be the ultimate goal for the Indian government and Indian society. Yes, it takes like was probably a decade to reach that. But what if like especially in the time of pandemic, like like having an election in a way that you don't physically need to appear any polling station, etc. So that's the ultimate trust that you actually can reach with your national digital identity. And uh, like Every country together, government and private sector, should do that. And if you need any help, we are there to help you. And if you have any questions now or afterwards, we are also in the breakout sessions, like you can ask us directly. Thank you for having us. Thank you for keeping interest on Proud Engineers. Thank you. Uh, well, Tavi, thank you so much for, for being with us here on stage and also sharing that lovely photo of the team uh, at the end. Um, so we have plenty of questions that all received a similar number of uh, upvotes, so we'll, we'll go through them one by one. Uh, there are some very good ones indeed. But before we do, of course, we have uh, the final uh, task, the final poll results to look at. Uh, do you think there are limitations on where EIDs can work? And uh, it's, it's almost unanimous. Uh, people agree that yes, EID can come in different forms and work uh, around the world. I think that's a, a very fair assessment. EIDs are not limited to democracies, I, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, like uh, <coughs> uh, we have seen better results in societies where there is no democracy, <laughs> if, I say, if I can say so. Or if there is a democracy in China? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say limited democracy. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's uh, yeah. You can say many many things about authoritarian versus democratic states, uh, but if you have one person at the top who makes decisions and who can force them through today, then yes, some things can also be decided much faster and implemented faster. Uh, heading over to the questions from the audience, uh, the first one is: How do you foster the right attitude and spirit for a country who already has an EID and the, the responsible KPI or PKIs, uh, but that just don't know how to use it and transform it? to success so like where is the disconnect happening there uh, the connection is uh, or disconnection uh, happens where you don't have enough use cases uh, mm. like uh, people use only those tools that they need every day so if the digital ID can only be used let's say for government services then people don't use government services every day what they use every day is for example financial services if the financial sector doesn't allow you to, to use the same tools mm. like uh, and provide other tools there's already, this system is already broken. Yeah. So uh, basically, let's, you, you should start uh, from the fact that you fix the fact that big players, especially in finance sector and telecom, actually support your identity. Um, I, I believe one of the very first services that came online in Germany uh, was that you could, with your electronic uh, ID card, that you could renew your passport, uh, which of course we do every day because passports are only valid for a couple of days. Uh, so a very, very useful service uh, indeed. I like the sarcasm. Yeah, um, <laughs> no sarcasm dis detected here. Um, another question is, uh, and, and I think that... The answer has several layers, but doesn't creating universal electronic IDs also mean that you create one single point of failure? Uh, yes and no. I mean, uh, definitely uh, even Estonia has seen uh, downsides. I mean, uh, let's say if there is a threat uh, on your crypto that like, it might be hacked or, or compromised somehow, definitely uh, it will, like, uh, I'll say, uh, influence this. Mm. And that's why it's important that, uh, yes, you have some kind of core uh, identity, let's say that an Estonian engaged ID card that is issued uh, by the government, but in every day you actually have multiple different uh, authentication methods like yeah. smart ID, mobile ID, etc. So if one fails, like still other, other, other tools are working. Uh, so uh, having different options here is very important. Like. Uh, so it's not, as you said, it's, it has a, it's a question with different layers. But what is good about it that, <coughs> um, uh, for example, when you create a new portal or you come out with a new service, uh, it's very easy to onboard uh, new customers or, or like uh, new people because uh, you don't have to worry about uh, like uh, sign up thing or like uh, <coughs> how, how I actually get the understanding who is actually talking with me. Like, yeah. uh, 
in which level uh, of security I can provide services, like can I deal with money or not, like all those questions like can be easily removed and it very, becomes very simple to create new digital services. Uh, also, I guess uh, at least we should we should talk about for just one second uh, something like the X Road, uh, some sort of data exchange, meaning that there is not one super database where uh, if there is a failure with the electronic ID that uh, or the universal uh, personal code behind that, that all of the data is immediately accessible. So yes, even if uh, you would only have an electronic ID card and none of the other carriers, um, you could at least uh, divide all the different database responsibilities so that not everything is open all at once. So there are different measures uh, that you can take for sure. Um, what countries has Proud Engineers been active in? And do the hurdles, uh, this is interesting, uh, do the hurdles to digitalization differ from country to country? Uh, yes, it's absolutely true. The hurdles actually depend on, uh, uh, like it it's also has a very like cultural uh, aspect. Um, I mean, as a consulting uh, like company or or like, uh, like giving opinions and and uh, uh, charging uh, like different countries, like the list is more than 25. Mm. Uh, we have been more active with Japanese my number. Uh, this is like I also want to point out as our failure, because we, in the end of the day we were not capable to convince uh, the government uh, not to follow German uh, <laughs> model and look for the Scandinavian model. Yep. Uh, we are very active in, uh, in uh, Arabic countries, mm -hmm. uh, also in India, uh, and obviously in Europe where we do most. Um, so, so the, the the different hurdles would be culture-based, political. How I would mean, you? it's uh, in Anglo-Saxon countries there is a hurdle of privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there is a false understanding that uh, they think if it, if every silo collects data about you separately and deals with you separately, it protects your privacy more than than, than systems where everything is connected. Yeah. Uh, so that is in Canada, in US, in Australia, Germany, UK. Uh, and the list goes, goes on. Uh, there are countries who don't actually who talk about digitalization, but actually don't want to go digital and start building those basic building blocks mm. because of corruption. Because yeah. like if uh, uh, society becomes more digital, there is less ways to to or say. It's a transparent society for everybody. Yeah, it's, it's, it's terrible. Too much transparency, like, <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah. if society are dependent on those uh, bribes, like, then. Uh, the like, mechanisms, yeah. yeah. So you don't want to get rid of that. Uh, so, uh, like, there are a lot of societies where people actually cannot see the need, mm -hmm. and that's it's very important to define like uh, what can get better, like if we actually do this. Like, what if private sector and government sector are capable to identify a person uh, in, a, in 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 a one and only way, and what? Does, what cool things it, it brings, brings to the society and what kind of like, future service you can build on top of that. This is, an, in, many, in many cases, this is a, is, is a key problem. People actually cannot see the future. Mm. Uh, one last question, um, also because you mentioned uh, i-voting uh, in your presentation. In case of i-voting, how would the state know if the right citizen is voting at the uh, other end of the computer? Um, please, your explanation. I mean, like, uh, first of all, like, uh, in Estonia, we have a very good population registry. As everybody has a unique identifier, we actually know who has a voting right and who doesn't have a voting right. So it means that, like, if person, like, who has a voting right accesses our voting system uh, with secure digital identity, like uh, the system is clear that, okay, we can allow you in. And uh, like uh, how we know like that you are behind device is like the way how our identity is built up. So it's something you have and something you know. Mm. I mean, the identity has given to you and you only, and only you know the pins like uh, how to use it. So we can assume that behind the computer is you. I, I, what I what I like about this is also that because we only have one electronic identity at at the foundation, um, uh, it means that if you technically it would be possible for me to give you my ID card and my PIN codes, and then you could vote on my behalf. But of course, if I do that, I would also open the gate to every single other service uh, on my behalf. So you could also look into my healthcare records and everything else. I mean, I but actually would uh, most probably go to your bank account. That yeah, is so uh, it's, uh, at least equally I handy. I mean, if, I can, if you give me a chance to steal money instead of voting on your behalf, like... Yeah. Uh, you would take 
take it. I would take my, I think, money first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very safe bet. Um, so so what, I'm, what I'm trying to say with this is, because we have pooled all of this into one electronic uh, authentication method, effectively, um, um, we make it less likely that people would be willing to sell their vote or, or anything like that because they would give access to the person for everything else. And very importantly, with online voting, you can change your vote afterwards as well. There's always a seven-day period where you can vote as many times as you want online and only the last vote counts. You want to Yeah, that's the point. I yeah. mean, like, buying or selling votes doesn't... Doesn't like really help. work in Estonia. Yeah. Uh, but... One correction, like there are actually multiple ways how to authentication methods. Yeah. Yes, so yes, it's not the only one. I misspoke. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, Davi, thank you so much for for being with us today.